in Tennessee where Faithful is alive. And his shots ring from the wall. Take off 45. His life is good. She's wearing all any problem to show. He's coming here in Nashville. Yes, Hickok 45, your internet shooting companion, coming to you from the, uh, the greening hills of Tennessee. Yes, Tennessee, the home of, get ready, are you ready for it? Home of the Grand Ole Opry. Yes, so uh, maybe you've been there. Yeah, how can I forget the Grand Ole Opry? Downtown Nashville, originally, uh, at the Ryman. Been there, told you about going to see Chris Lunsford. And of course, I went in the 70s, took my parents to see, uh, gosh, Bill Monroe and Roy Acuff and Ernest Tubbs and all those, those folks that were still there, you know, every weekend singing and everything. So, yeah, home of the Grand Ole Opera. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you're here and uh, home of the ticks and, and everything now that we're greening up a bit. Once it gets to this point, it comes fast, doesn't it? It really does. Uh, the, uh, what do you call them, may pops or what, all through the woods I'm seeing down in there. Probably just loaded with ticks on the underside. John and I d discovered long ago that they ticks like to get on the underside of the may pop. I think they're called may pops, I think. And they cover the forest floor, you know, <laughs> in a lot of places. And uh, you walk through those and you may pick up some ticks. They kind of know, ticks are smart. They get where, uh, they actually jump out of the tree, land on your shoulder, you know, they're dive bombers. But they get on the grass. Someone mentioned, I, I don't know, I, I talk, was talking about it one week and someone said, well, I said, good to know they get on the weeds or something like that. Well, yeah, they, they get on the weeds and the grass and, the, and places like that, the maypops, because they know an animal is likely to walk through there and, you know, they just jump on it or whatever. Easier than jumping up from the ground, maybe, I don't know. Or, or waiting for the animal to stop and lie down and crawl onto the animal, right? So, yep, I'm here and uh, it is uh, uh, not a bad day. This is uh, the day this week that it's not raining. And uh, yeah, got some things going on too. I'll tell you about later, Saturday. But uh, so, I'm here, and uh, it's it's just great to be here in uh, the spring of things, where it's not too cold at all. And you're here. You have a couple of firearms. You saw one of them, and you're some of you are wondering what the heck is that? I didn't know you had any nickel-plated Colt single actions, or maybe you do know that, and you have seen some from the Wayback Machine, some of the older videos. You saw me with one or two. I don't bring them out much. I do have a couple. And this ain't one of them. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. Also, I want a disclaimer. You need to do this every week. Uh, you know, periodically there'll be somebody that, you know, they don't understand the Sunday videos. I don't understand the Sunday videos, do you? I don't know what a Sunday video is, but you know, they've probably been watching videos. Where we sort of get right to it and shoot and talk about the gun, demonstrate it or whatever even though I'd even do that in a long-winded fashion, but then it come out on Sunday, oh, what is going on? Am I on drugs or something? Anyway, disclaimer, this is a Sunday shoot around, everybody, if you're new. Uh, so, and then don't forget tomorrow. What is tomorrow? April 15th. Yeah, sad day, tax day, right? April 15th. <laughs> Make sure you've got yourself in order. Surely you already have them in the mail. Although a lot of people wait till the 15th. And you know, I, I recall, I guess people still do that. Rolling up to uh, the post office in Nashville or Franklin, Tennessee, where I used to live, and, and they'd be dropping them off, you know, uh, that day, I think, what, by midnight or something, and it would still be uh, postmarked the 15th, and you're okay, they weren't late if they're postmarked the 15th, and all that sort of thing. And I, 
I don't like to pay taxes anymore than anybody else, but I, I also don't want to be burdened by it up to the last freaking minute, day, you know, so, uh, anyway, so, so yeah, it's tomorrow, I got mine in and made my last big payment and everything, and so, uh, yep, it's a necessary evil, right? But, as I've said, I don't like to complain about uh, the, the many dollars I, I uh, pay in taxes. Uh, because it all goes to such a good cause. You know, every single dollar is used wisely. Don't you think? Don't you think? <laughs> New people are really wondering what? <laughs> that don't know my sick sense of humor. <laughs> all right, yep, so what do I have? Uh, yep, this is April 14th. And uh, I thought, well, you know what? I, I need to get, I even shot dad's guns for a while and this is uh, April 14th Sunday and that's the day I lost him April 14th exactly 30 years ago and I guess uh, if there's ever a, a good day to <laughs> we can call it an anniversary I guess it sort of is but but uh yeah 30 years to the day and I thought well let me get dad's couple of his favorite well probably his two favorite firearms out and shoot them this old uh, well, what is this? Some of you know, don't you? It's a Texas Marshal, and it's a Hall, it's a uh, Halls or a J.P. Siren Son, uh, made in Western Germany. It's kind of cool, you know, because uh, I don't know that I have ever been able to pinpoint the actual exact year he bought it, but it was uh, I had gotten him interested in firearms in the early '70s when I started getting into it talked about that a lot and he'd always wanted a Colt or a gun like a Colt that the Cowboys carried and everything and he wasn't a gun collector uh, uh, as knowledgeable and I wasn't either at the time but he uh, he just knew hey, that's what John Wayne carried and Billy the Kid and everybody else you know he thought in the movies at least and the shows and and, uh, and he ran across this there and I think probably in Florence Kentucky I think he bought it from a gosh he might be from there and older than dirt. You might remember Lawrence, I think it was Lawrence's, or Lawrence's, Lawrence's gun shop in Greenview. He was in a development. He was sort of out of his basement there uh, in Florence, Kentucky. I believe that's where he bought it. Because uh, I know we were in there and I, I bought a, a super Blackhawk there one time uh, But uh, when I was home. But uh, yeah, and so it was the, it would have been, you know, early 74, something like that. Probably about the same year I bought my Model 29, maybe 75 long in there. And he really liked this thing. He even, this got him into hand loading. I hand loaded for him for a long time, would give him ammo, and then he got into it, got pressed in a table, and he set it up. And he, he wasn't a, uh, oh, I mean, he could do anything. So, you know, he wasn't afraid to learn to do it and do it, and he did it and did fine, you know. Uh, but uh, I, I kind of got into just making sure he had plenty of ammo, you know. He was a little bit rough on it. And he loved this thing, though. And uh, he would go out to, we had, that was after we moved back into the town, Florence, and, and then uh, they had sold the farm and all that, let someone talk him out of it. Here's an owl. And, uh, but they bought 50 acres again out there. Uh, no house or anything on it, and just go out and have a garden and different things out in Dry Ridge in Grant County, and uh, go back and forth, you know, on weekends, go out there and putter around the place, and he loved the garden and, and mess around, and uh, he would store construction supplies and things, whatever out there, it was a construction business, but he would, he would always take this, and the 22 got it, got out, the, the made by high standard, but it's the Revelation Model 99. Uh, you've seen that, I hope, that uh, my mom bought him for Christmas. I was 10, it was 1960. So that one's been around for a long time. I've shot it a lot. And this one, I haven't shot this one as much, but uh, and I wouldn't even have it, of course, if he were still here. Um, but um, so yeah, 350, and it's 357. A JP Sire and Son with Texas Marshall. Some of you have these. I've heard from you back through the years when I got this out. The first time, Hall's Firearms, Los Angeles, California. And uh, I think it's stainless, it's not nickel. And uh, 
market, they have a pretty good reputation. Of course, when I look at it and see it and mess with it, I see everything that is is not Ruger or not Colt. It's kind of weird in places in the firing pin, different things, but it seems real solid, pretty solid. And he liked that pearl, fake pearl handle. And uh, oh yeah, he bought a holster for it. Yeah, that's it. He'd put that on his belt. And when he'd go out to the farm and he'd just mess around out there and he'd plink with that. Lots of times I wasn't with him when I would be home because I was in college or living down here, Franklin, Tennessee. and. Uh, you know, I was out teaching, you know, <laughs> uh, disturbing the minds of young people. Uh, and, uh, and, but he would uh, take it out there every time he went out and uh, shoot for whatever protection if he needed it, but also just to plank with and the 22. And when I'd come home, we'd go out there, I'd bring some guns, we'd go out and shoot, and he'd always bring these and, and shoot them. So I was the gun nut, of course, and uh, he had, in his will, he had, had a note that I got first choice of, of his firearms. He just had maybe eight or 10 total. But, uh, and I, I chose this one because I knew it meant so much to him, his favorite favorite gun, 357 Magnum, 38. Wasn't a 45, if it had been a 45, he might not have bought it. I, I don't know, uh, 45 ammo wasn't something you saw everywhere and he wouldn't have uh, probably liked what he had to pay for it, that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> But uh, 38 is funny though. Now 38s are really popular in these things. Let's shoot some, some more. All right, let's hit this bullseye again. How about that Kentucky two liter? Since they lost in the NCAA tournament right away. <laughs> oh, let me throw another one at the gong. I don't know where I was going out there. Oh, I heard it. All right. <laughs> Click. Notice that front sight. I repainted it orange. He always kept orange uh, uh, nail polish on it. You know, he learned that from me. I used it on some of my guns. And it was their sight paint back then. It's still used by a lot of people. And uh, so I recently just kind of redid that with some Birchwood Casey sight paint. And I, I used orange. I particularly like her. I generally like white, I think, on sides. Maybe a little green, I don't know. Orange, it just depends on the gun. But uh, since he liked orange, I just put orange back on there. Keep it original, right? So anyway, it was his, uh, his gun, and it's uh, hard to believe 30 years. Uh, speaking of young people advice, uh, I'll start with that. Be sure that you appreciate your older relatives, any of your relatives, friends, family, whoever it is, because they won't be here. You don't know when, but they won't be around. You might not be around, but could very well be them and they're gone and uh, they're not here to talk to anymore or ask questions or do anything. And you don't know when, so it's just, just a hard to imagine. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine my parents not being alive when I was, when they were alive. You just can't imagine it. It doesn't compute. You know, it doesn't compute because guess what? They've been around your whole life probably. Yeah, most likely. And uh, it just doesn't compute. Even when you see other people's parents die or whatever, it, you just think, wow, I, I, sure that won't happen to my family. You know, you just can't imagine it. And uh, it's hard to believe it's been 30 years. I remember I was teaching, I've told this story before, uh, out in Franklin and we were involved in computers and stuff. And I was in the middle of all that and I was helping, I was setting up a modem that morning. It was, uh, you know, 94. Uh, it was a Thursday morning. There I am, I got off to, to school like I did every day <laughs> to teach. And I was always there early and I was setting up a modem in this little office so kids could get in there and get access to the internet and do thing. And, and they could print, setting up a printer, mainly of setting up a printer. Maybe it wasn't a modem, it was 94. I think it was a modem actually, so you could get on the World Wide Web right there where we could see them. But, um, and I remember uh, our secretary came down, said I had a phone call from my niece. And I said, what? My niece? How would she even know them? How, she just, she would know where I teach? You know, it just didn't compute. It was really weird, you know. And I crawled out from under the table, 
uh, and I was under there on my back and hooking up something and and and, uh, and and no cell phone you know just go down to the office and get take the call you know and so I went down and she and I we had this room where he could make phone calls there and I, I thought it was odd when she said you can take it in there and she closed both doors I think uh, she knew yeah she knew something she didn't I don't know what uh, my niece had told her but yeah she knew and uh, so anyway, she gave me some privacy and, you know, they said that, you know, dad was in the hospital and all this and I could tell it was bad and maybe they weren't telling me everything. But by the time I got home, he was gone. So, like I say, you never know what the day is going to bring. Uh, you know, I'm just fat, dumb and happy working on a modem, getting ready for the day to work, you know, and that afternoon, as fast as I get up there, I'm up there, find out Dad's already passed, you know, by two or three o'clock or whatever, and and, um, and we're at the funeral home picking out funeral arrangements, doing funeral arrangements, you know, like three or four, five, whatever, with my mom and my brother, and then two days later, you know, funeral, you know, burying, you know, so it happens fast, and uh, it is quite often a surprise, so. Take advantage of the people that are in your family while they're here, all right? So anyway, not to start off on a sad note, it's been 30 years, and I like to, uh, I mean, you never get totally used to it, right? You lose people, it's not like it, you grow out of it or something. You miss them uh, forever, but uh, it's it's neat uh, if you're a farms enthusiast, if you're a boating enthusiast, whatever it is, you know, there's some things that remind you of them and uh, you feel like they're more with you when you're doing it. If you're out fishing, you know, and you and your dad like to fish or something. And shooting is kind of that way if, if you're uh, folks that have passed on, whether it's an uncle or a grandpa or your dad or your mom or whoever, if you used to go shooting together, then, and especially if you have one of their firearms, it's, it's kind of neat to, to bring it out. I, I highly uh, encourage people to do that. Sometimes I hear from people that, hear from a lot of people who have lost their dad, really, or grandpa, a lot of you, and you'll tell me about how you watch the videos with him, you know, and everything, and it's just, wow. And it's just, you know, it's just, you know, I hate to hear it. Uh, it's this circle of life, isn't it? Uh, but, you know, people sometimes tell me that they, uh, they have their gun, how special it is, or their shotgun, or whatever it is. And I get the impression sometimes, whether they say it or not, that they don't want to shoot it. They just want to maybe get out and shine it up or something. They're afraid to shoot it. Maybe they're not even a, an avid shooter or something. But but I, I encourage people to, you know, you know, the guns I have. I've got guns that are 150 years old, and they still shoot fine. You know, you clean them up, and it just... Uh, Take it out occasionally and shoot it if you've got a firearm like that, a sentimental firearm. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a way to honor whoever passed, you know, whoever it belonged to, I think. Uh, you're not going to hurt it. You can have anything fixed about it that needs to be fixed if that happens. <laughs> Good old 22 revelation. For those who don't know, you missed the videos on these things over the years. Uh, these were made by High Standard and they were sold at Western Auto. In fact, Western Auto used to be like Sears or like, what's, what's something you can relate to? <laughs> Any more department, Macy's, you know, I mean, these stores that everybody knew about. Uh, they were in every little town, big town, uh, Western Auto. And they were kind of just a hardware store with, I guess, a kind of a, a slant towards uh, automotive stuff. Imagine that. Like, uh, you know, like you go to Walmart, you got all the hardware, but you've got a uh, auto section is it's kind of a hardware store with an automotive section I guess you know uh, Western Auto and they were everywhere uh, it says right on the side on the barrel Western Auto Supply that's, that's kind of neat you know uh, yeah so and this thing's always been a good a good gun I, I think they made them maybe for some other uh, outlets I think under high standard it's called what the Sentinel uh, but this has the Revelation, Revelation on the barrel end right here. Revelation was the name brand they used for Western Auto. I don't think it was called uh, Revelation for any other stores, but uh, but they're made by High Standard, and High Standard has a reputation of making quality firearms. So it's, it's neat to shoot this too. Again, I've been shooting this since I was, I was 10 years old. 
and I, I've told the story. Can I load it to you again? Uh, when we bought this first farm, 50 acres, uh, with a house and lived there, dad remodeled it and all that. But uh, there was an old pond and someone had uh, trashed a, a car in it, some old like 40s or 50s uh, car. Of course, I wasn't that old at the time. That was 1960, but, and it was in the, uh, in that pond, I believe it was turned upside down, as I recall, in that, and that pond was dry. It eventually covered all that up or whatever, cleaned it out, but, and I would take this gun, <laughs> this gun, when I was like 11 or 12, and I, dad wouldn't let me take the pistol out for maybe a year or so until I proved I could, you know, shoot, shoot the rifle, I was, I was safe, but, um, but I'd walk around the place in a uh, pocket full of 22 ammo, not full, but enough. And I remember standing there and shooting a door in that car. And here I was 11 or 12. It was obviously a junk car turned upside down and been wrecked or something. How many people get to shoot an old car with a, a pistol when you're 11, you know, or something like that. And uh, so anyway, I've always liked to just shoot stuff that deserve to be shot, metal things that, uh, you know, Recycling things as a target, put it that way. All right, let's see if I can hit anything with this. As I recall, it, it usually uh, sights are pretty much all a good thing, huh? <laughs> well, how about you, Clyde? You get hit with Dad's gun? <laughs> yeah, he'd like you. He'd think you're funny. <laughs> Did I hear it? Yeah, I heard it that time. All right. I can get the gong with that. Oh, man. Did I say Alabama holster? I don't think Alabama holster made this. Uh, this is, uh, this actually, I was looking at, handmade by Viking, Mexico. Okay, so in the early 70s, we were importing holsters from Mexico. Uh, Dad probably didn't see that or had a clue. He might not have bought that if he'd seen that. But it's actually fairly, it's kind of a Hollywood type, you know, the low hung, low slung. It's, I think it's got metal in, in there to keep it, uh, you know, form fitting and everything. He, he liked it. He kept this gun in it. He would, you know, be in there and, you know, hidden away, unloaded, but uh, that's what he did. So anyway, uh, like I say, appreciate the people while they're here because they won't always be here. And uh, neither will you, neither will I. And uh, it's just a fact of life. Uh, went up to, uh, drove up to, uh, where is it? Paducah, Kentucky this week to see the eclipse. Yeah, you probably, I don't know if you knew that, but in Paducah, Kentucky, which is just about an hour and a half for me, a little more normally, uh, I think everybody in Tennessee was driving up I-24 to Paducah and back. Uh, but uh, something go something going on uh, in Paducah, Kentucky. Maybe it's a Kentucky thing. The uh, the Kentucky solar system is screwed up or something. They they let their moon uh, in their solar system like move in front of their sun. Yeah, we, we don't allow that stuff in Tennessee. It was interesting to see. And I didn't make fun of the Kentuckians while I was up there just because they got some really goofy solar system up there. But, uh, but you know, it was neat, I have to say, getting dark in the middle of the day. But, uh, but then again, I just soon drive to Kentucky to see that kind of weird stuff happen. So that was fine. We don't allow that in Tennessee, really. But that was a neat trip uh, when I had lunch. Uh, by the way, I drove up, I told you all a few weeks ago, I drove up to Dixie Gunworks, uh, you know, kind of that way. And, uh, West Tennessee found a neat gun shop up there. I wasn't aware of uh, last flight Last flight outfitters it was called. Yeah uh, Quite a place and uh, but anyway, I do that when I'm around Well, I was in Paducah. I stopped by what was the name of that place uh, up there? It was Paducah shooting supplies. I think yeah stopped in there and looked around before the eclipse they were uh, closing up for a couple hours during the eclipse you know they they were aware that their solar system is all screwed up and uh, they didn't apologize for it but they they closed up uh, from like one to three or something but uh, got to browse around there a little bit and uh, yeah 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> what do you want to shoot? So they, these are both nice, nice guns. They're uh, they're not uh, like Primo Museum piece, you know, firearms, high standard revelation. What sold out of Western Auto probably sold to me, you know, these things. But good solid gun. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people that have them, and uh, they they speak highly. They've had good experiences with them. And kind of the same with the JP Siren son. They have a good reputation. This thing's built you know, like a brick. Brick outhouse or something. It's kind of chunky, kind of heavy. It's kind of like the early Ruger's big old heavy gun in a lot of ways. Man, you ought to be able to shoot anything in that. I don't know if you, it's empty. I don't know if you can see the, the thickness of uh, those chamber walls and everything. It's like a, like kind of like a Vaquero in 357. <laughs> yeah. Unless you're using some cheap steel, you ought to be able to touch off an atomic 357 round in, in, in one of these. So and I fixed the handle; it was coming loose. Um, you know the screw and all that and the collar. Is, but I think I got it all glued and in good shape. I want to keep it running. Yep. Uh, oh, oh, Dad, that uh, you know to do that. So. Anyway, let me shoot it again, can I? Oh, I've been talking about the women's basketball. I watched the uh, finals and the semifinals. I think last week I mentioned seeing Caitlin Clark play. I said it was in the final four, but it was at, it hadn't even taken place yet, I think. It was in the, the lead eight, right, where she got nine three-pointers and all that. It was neat to see her play uh, if I hadn't seen her play. Um, and then I got to see her again in the uh, final four. And that was that was cool. And again, I don't mean to diss her. I love to watch you know any basketball if I can get into the game. I used to watch when I was teaching. I probably saw, of course, I coached some, but I probably saw more girls' games than boys' games, or at least an equal number. Because I would go to my students' games. I always appreciated when I was playing when my teachers would show up at a game, and I just I just I just liked it. I don't think anybody does probably. And. Uh, and I knew it meant a lot to me in high school and in college when I'd see uh, you know, my professors there and that kind of thing. And and uh, and I know the, the kids loved it when teachers would show up, especially if I'm not there, I'm not coaching, I don't have to be there. And I and uh, I knew it meant a lot to them. And I would I would try not to pat myself on the back. I just did it. You know, why be there if I'm not going to do something worthwhile? And I would go to their games, away games, boys and girls. When I wasn't coaching, I would just try. If I didn't have stuff I needed to get home, I'd go go watch them play. You know, girls and boys, or just the girls one game maybe, and then the boys another. But I would watch them. Same with volleyball. And uh, and but anyway, I enjoyed the girls' games. When John was playing, my wife and I would go to the games early and watch the girls' game and enjoy that as much as the boys' game that would follow. You know, we didn't just show up at the end of the girls' game to watch John play the boys' game. I mean, we might have done that a time or two. We didn't have a choice, but we would we tried to go and we would watch all of both games. I've enjoyed girls' basketball, women's basketball, and I haven't seen that many women's college games. I'll have to say, um, when I played, I don't think we had a women's team at Austin P. Yeah, in the late 60s, early 70s, but or at Western Carolina. But but uh, anyway, so when I make a crack about, uh, well, the only thing that bothers me is as great as she is, uh, you know, she, she hadn't played against the men, you know, she played with the women's ball, it's a smaller ball and all that kind of thing. So that's the only reason I, I, I you know, it's silly to compare her with Pete Maravich or anybody else, you know, she's the greatest maybe women's player of all time. I don't know. I, I'm, I'll give I'll give everybody that. You know, it's just compare apples to apples is, is just the main thing. Uh, you know, I played in uh, the Ohio Valley Conference, and uh, uh, kind of a similar thing. I, I I was just playing against people in my conference. I was uh, for a while till I wrecked my ankle. I guess it was the first year I played. I uh, for a while, I was one of the leading rebounders in the country. I remember someone showed me a, a Sports Illustrator, Sports Magazine, and they had a list of the top rebounders in Division One, NCAA, or whatever it was. And I didn't ever get those mags. I didn't know what was in those magazines. I was just dumb at the time, ignorant. I just was playing off away from home. And uh, I remember one of the players 
threw that in my lap on the bus one day. We were off, heading off to a game. He said, man, you're number six, you know. And I thought, really, what? What's that? You know, I, I didn't follow statistics or any kind of thing like that. Well, I, I was maybe number six for a while, but I was playing against OVC competition. You know, I wasn't playing against Duke and Kentucky, and, you know, that kind of thing. There was some tough competition in the Ohio Valley Conference, Western Kentucky, you know, Middle Tennessee, and, you know, Western went to Final Four one of the years I played and all that. We beat them that year. But, you know, I mean, there was some tough competition, of course. But, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have been at, at the top of the rebounders if I had uh, probably been playing against UCLA, you know, or just other teams. So that's why you have leagues and different leagues. You have women's games and men's games and all that kind of thing. So uh, even though it's said I was the sixth leading rebounder in the country, yeah, sort of, yeah, I, but not really the way I looked at it. But anyway, uh, very interesting, very interesting to watch uh, uh, her play. I, I don't know if I'll see her in the WNBA. I don't know if I've ever seen one of those games. Oh, one thing I wasn't going to complain about. Can I do that? The, yeah, it was the, it was, what game was it? Uh, yeah, then I was going to watch the, the final game, the women's game, even though Iowa was not. Well, yeah, they were in it, obviously, but they lost it, right. So I was going to watch the final game and had it ready to go and Wow, find out where it was. It was on ESPN, the Woke Network. I mean to tell you, I thought, what is going on here? They had these two or three uh, gals talking, and, and uh, I thought, okay, once the game starts, that'll go away, and someone will be announcing a game or whatever. And I, I was working on a computer, too, to look up. And I was like, what? The game has started, and they're still yakking about random stuff. They got some other gal from... I don't know, one of the news networks, and I think Snoop Dogg showed up. and But they were just rambling, uh, random stuff, and yeah, ha ha, yakking it up. You're like some podcast. You ever turn into a podcast where maybe the topic is something, kind of like me, uh, random stuff. You'd like to, to hear something about whatever the, the subject may be, but they just yucking it up and telling jokes, and they never talk about anything, you know, uh, that you came to hear them talk about. But they all have they all have all this inside humor and inside stories and and I mean that's what I kept looking at like is this what ESPN is going to do for this championship game? No wonder women's basketball doesn't do any better in terms of viewership. They're stuck on ESPN with with no real no professional announcers or color what do you call it color guy you know or color person you know, there's always someone who announces to get. Or, does a play-by-play -play more or less, not like radio. And then somebody just like in football offers their opinion. They're usually a, a player and, and they, they chime in when it's appropriate. Well, these gals, whoever they were, yakking and yakking, did y'all see that? Am I just getting too old? Is that it? I mean, I, I had to leave. I couldn't watch it. I didn't, I came outside and did some stuff. I came back in near the end to see the end, but I mean, I just, it was unwatchable. It was literally unwatchable, in my opinion, okay? Remember, that's just my opinion. Let's shoot something. This should be a click, but it may not be. Yeah. All right, let me throw one at the gong again. Do y'all know, was I going low or, or high? Uh, I didn't see it kick up anything. I don't think. I'm going to hold lower. I still didn't see it kick up. Man, that was a hot round, but you can tell me I've locked this thing up. You know, I think that happened in one of the videos. That's the first full magnum round I've shot today. Yeah, I'm, I couldn't remember what the problem I had with this was. <laughs> that may be the last shot today with that. I'm not going to mess with it too much right now. Well, I have to take it back and take it apart. Oh well. Uh, yeah, I, I knew I had another problem or something was going on with the action once and I just had forgotten what it was. I had two problems with this, with this gun. The, the grip, 
the screw and everything. I got all that epoxied and glued back together. And then I, I've shot it a time or two and messed with it. And I, it, it seemed fine. And uh, I kind of forgot what the problem was. I think that was it. Y'all, someone here might probably remember. Yeah, I think it was kind of like this. I was shooting it, maybe it was a Sunday video a couple of years ago or something. And that, that's really locked up. I don't know. It went off, so there's not a uh, there's not a round like yeah, anything like a squib. In fact, I can see light between the you know, forcing cone and the cylinder, so there's nothing there. It might be, I think, what it is. There is just like no space between that uh, the back of that cylinder and the recoil shield and everything. I, I bet you with that recoil, that primer. Uh, backed up just a hair and it's just locked up tired of the drum. So oh well, I'll work on it I didn't want to shoot it again. <laughs> anyway, I did want to hit the gong and figure it out I will get it fixed report back to you and bring it out again. So sorry dad. We'll get her fixed So I'll shoot this again before I let you go. Is there anything else you needed to know? Don't forget the Hickok 45 clips channel, okay? All right I'm still cranking them out every morning. People are still confused. I see, I, I see people just like I said last week. I think, what prompted you to do a video on this? Was this really bothering you, or was this a? Because yeah, it is. It didn't. We didn't think about that. I guess it didn't matter. But the way you get, the way you get videos. Yeah, I. You know, it's, it's rare that you get a video by uh, at least a, most people, I guess, going to the channel and looking them up, you know, uh, and it just shows up in your feed. Uh, it does me too, the Hickok 45 clip, a video will pop up, you know, and, uh, and so, oh, there's Hickok, and they don't see the Hickok 45 clips down there, it shows you what channel it's from, I guess, and uh, you got to kind of look for that, don't you? And uh, It'll just, well, there I am, and I'm talking or something. Well, hey, hey, Hickok posted a video. I haven't seen this one. And uh, so I'm talking about something, random thing, or shooting something. So they just think it's a new video. And they wonder why it started the way it did. It just looked like I was just starting in the middle of something. And then also, I don't end with life is good or anything. And you know, someone says, where's, what happened to life is good? You know, they, so they don't realize they're, they're looking at something from the Hickok 45 Clips channel. It's actually a different, different channel. <laughs> So a little confusion about that. And again, it, it makes whatever is going on, uh, whatever I'm talking about, uh, seem sometimes out of context or more important. It's like, like I was telling you about you know, mean co the one called Mean Comments or something, John called it. Uh, it's like I just jumped up out of my chair one day and said, John, I need to do a video about the mean comments. I just can't take it anymore. Or something. <laughs> yeah, that's what it looks like when you look at that, if you think it is on the main channel, whereas it's a just a piece taken out of some long, boring conversation, you know, and I think from one of the Shooting the Breezes. Uh, yeah, yeah, because I looked it up. It's funny. It's, it's Shooting the Breeze 33, which I normally would never remember, but I, I made a mental note of that because someone said something about slam fire. And so I went to it, and sure enough, that's one of the videos where he was on the table at the beginning, you know. And so I try to remember that so that if somebody wants to see Slam Fire, they can get a good look at old Slam Fire, my best buddy, by going to Shooting the Breeze number 33. So if you've not seen that, do it. Say hi to Slam Fire. He is extra cute. Yes, he is. All right. I'm going to pop a little quiet, I think. Well, I thought I was. There we go. We are kidding. How about that cowboy? <laughs> yeah. Alright, uh, those sights are actually on. If I'm missing, I'm just missing. Ah, you know what? There's a bad round in there. I thought maybe I just didn't load up. Uh, chamber. Let's hit them again. Let's really be a bad round. Either that or it's an empty. Nope. It's a round. Wow. That's the thing about 22 ammo. 
And this is good stuff. It's Winchester Super X. Yeah. Again, thanks to Wideners.com. Check them out. Uh, look at the hard hit on that uh, that rim. Let's see if we can make it go. I don't even like having one of those in my hand when they do that. I say, which way is the cylinder going this guy? And I forgot. Oh, come on. I'm going to destroy both of Dad's guns here. If I'm not careful. Now I just did some weird uh, putting it in with a hammer cocked, half cocked, or something. Okay, I'm just going to take that back. <laughs> now I got to fix Dad's guns. That one we've never had any trouble with. I just did something weird there. I think as I as I as I knew it as I was doing it when I was you couldn't see me I guess when I was putting the cylinder back in I had the hammer cocked and I was just in the process of letting it down or something it's something dumb so it's not that I uh, I can't probably figure it out here in a few minutes I I just don't like with the camera running and any kind of pressure. Um, which is a good thing to remember. You know, you don't want to be doing gunsmithing, um, trying to fix a mechanical issue under any kind of pressure, you know, if you want to avoid that. You know, you just, uh, you, you want to, okay, like this one is safe, that the round is way over here, so it's not like it's in danger of firing or anything. But I would put it on the workbench, look at it, maybe put a little valve stall in, whatever. And, okay, let's see, and then gently do some different things with it. Because you can easily, uh, you could do something dangerous, but more likely you could easily just damage the gun further, you know, whatever the problem is. So, oh well, sorry, Dad. We'll get them <laughs> back working. So, anyway, good to see you all, and I uh, appreciate you coming around. Like I say, April 14th is a, is a day I always remember, and uh, there's days that, that you remember. You feel free to share those. Uh, you, uh, you you never forget them. You remember the the details, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I could man, I could go through such incredible detail of that day and the funeral and everything. It just sticks with you, sticks with you. Uh, and 30 years go by very, very, very fast. And on both ends, you you might be fairly young right now in your teens, maybe 20, and you just feel like, well, my mom and dad. Uh, they married young, had you when they were pretty young, they're, they're in their 40s or something, or 50, they're not very old and all that, and you think you're going to have them forever, you don't, it's not going to be an issue, you feel like you're going to be, you know, 50 or 60 years old before you lose them or something, and you don't know that, yeah, you really don't, uh, and, uh, and, and of course that's just, uh, thinking in terms of uh, maybe a, a disease or something, get them. Dad had a, a, an aortic uh, aneurysm. And he had been a smoker for the first 50 years of his life and everything. And, but uh, uh, so you don't know what kind of hidden health issue you know they might have, or an uncle or a favorite aunt or whoever it might be. Not to be morbid, it's just uh, in a way it's. Um, it's an effort to be, in some way, more positive about life. Just being totally conscious of the fact, aware, totally aware of the fact uh, how short life is and how fragile it is. And if you're not aware of that, you're living in a, a, a fake world. You're living in a dream world. You know, and you might be in for some shocks. You're going to be in for shocks anyway. But, you know, so just acknowledging that and knowing that and always being aware of that and in so many ways, I think it enhances your appreciation of life, you know, the, the depth of meaning for you, the, the appreciation, the, the depth of appreciation, you know, for, for everything, you know, yourself, you know, your, your family and all that sort of thing. So, but at any rate, if you have uh, family members that have passed on and you are the curator of their firearms, uh, take better care of them than I have and don't break them <laughs> in videos. <laughs> Now that one's had that problem, and I'm not sure what it was. The the 22, I find almost, well, it's not had a problem, and it still doesn't. I just caused it to do that, I think. I shouldn't have been talking while I was shooting, right? Of course, I do that all the time. So I'm gonna let you go, and uh, wow, we're cranking right on through April, you know? So before you know it, it's going to be May. So 
Hope you're getting out and enjoying some of the weather. And uh, again, don't forget to get those taxes off. I don't want any of you to be in jail. We don't want to lose view viewers. You know, with you sitting in a cell, they probably won't let you watch our videos, you know, <laughs> from a jail cell. So uh, y'all take care and uh, I appreciate everybody that helps us and I appreciate you all coming around. Sure do. Life is good.